So let's take a look at antigens and antibodies. So how can we go about telling self from non-self? That's the real key here in the immune system, is how can we make sure that we're doing what we need to do against pathogens, whereas allowing our body not to attack itself. And that's where it falls down to the antigen. And remember, the antigen is any cell membrane component that indicates I belong to this, I should be here. Within the antigen, there are distinct areas known as epitopes, and those epitopes are going to distinguish each of the, each of the antigen markers within each of the various cells and possible pathogens that the immune cells are going to be interacting with. So what are the various characteristics of antigens that we have to worry about? Well, we have to remember is that the antigens are going to recognize me versus not me in terms of immune response. And all they are is a peripheral protein on the cell. What we have to remember, however, and this is where a lot of the books get stuff mixed up, is that antigens don't equal pathogens and pathogens don't equal antigens. In order to be a pathogen, we have to have two, two key features. They have to induce an immunogenic response. They have to provoke an immune response. And they have to, be, have to induce immune reactivity. That is, the antigen itself has to specifically trigger antibodies once that immune cell, in particular the B cell, gets provoked. When we look at pathogenic antigens, it's typically a very small portion of the total antigen marker that actually triggers the response, the epitope or the anti what's referred to as the antigenic determinant. It's not the entire antigen, even though there are some antigens itself that will act as pathogens. Sometimes it's the entire micro microbe that can be the antigen, even though it's not typically the entire microbe. One example of a microbe that can act as an antigen all by itself is the prion, which is nothing more than a misshaped uh, protein. And this misshaped prion protein is what has been linked to a lot of degenerative diseases, particularly neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's, Leukey bodies, Parkinson's. And the problem is, is that all of the PPEs that we wear, the Prions themselves are actually smaller than the openings available, than the openings uh, within the PPEs. The PPEs will still have openings, which means that stuff can come in and out. They're usually smaller than what most of the microbes that we're trying to protect against. However, the prions are so small that even the smallest openings within the PPEs are still much larger than the prions themselves, which is where you have to be very careful because we've seen prion transmissions between patients and caregivers, even with caregivers wearing PPEs. So how does the antigen go about triggering a pathogenic response if it's coming from a pathogen. This is where we have two means of interaction. What's referred to as the exogenous interaction and the endogenous interaction. And it has to do with what's referred to as the MHC complex. In the, in the exogenous response, what's happening is that the cell has been infected and what it does is it presents a modified antigen marker to itself. And what this modified antigen marker to itself does is it causes the T cell to bind and become activated, thereby activating all of the other areas. When we talk about how the antigen receptor goes about doing this, it's mainly about the major histocompatibility complexes, the MHCs. And there's a whole cluster of MHCs, and the cluster of MHCs 
will cause a differential response based off of the CD arrangement on the T cell or the B cell or the immune cell that is being interacted with. The antigen receptin region on the T cell and B cell it occurs through um, genetic recombination and epigenetic uh, regulation so that the cell can respond to a whole cluster of various pathogenic antigens and or antigenic markers to trigger an immune response. So here's two examples of the response based off of the CD8 and CD4 interactions. And the way in which we look at this in terms of which MHC complex they're going to respond to is that the multiple of the CD factor and the MH factor, MHC factor will always go to 8, which means that if I'm a CD8, I'm going to respond to the MH, MHC1, where if I'm a CD4, I'm going to respond to the MHC2. Now, this only responds in terms of the CD4 and CD8. There are a whole cluster of CD factors in terms of immune response. And once again, I've given you a table within the packet as to what types of CD factors are going about. Please note how the MH1 and MH, MHC1 and MHC2 uh, antigen markers get recombined based off of infection, where we have the MH, MHC2 having actual pathogenic proteins being embedded within the process, whereas within the MHC1, when it happens, we get recombination of the actual MHC protein indicating that, hey, I am infected. So it's the way in which the cells integrate the infection signal as to what causes the change within the MH, MHC factors. In response to infection, we get a whole host of what are referred to as inflammatory biomarkers. Most of these inflammatory biomarkers come from uh, the immune cells themselves, and we refer to them as interleukins. These can act as paracrine signals, autocrine signals, and immune signals. They're going to trigger immune responses throughout the tissues and are the key characteristic in sales response to stress and infection leading to disease and illness. They're going to attract immune cells to the areas. They're going to trigger changes of permeability leading to inflammation. They're going to trigger changes of metabolism. They're going to trigger the release of secondary proteins known as uh, pyrogens that lead to whole body fevers when we have infections. So let's take a look at the IGs in particular. The ILs, I've given you a large table of the various ILs within the packet. The IGs themselves are going to trigger me versus not me. The immunoglobulin is the globular protein that's going to go and attach to the antigen itself. There's what are referred to as the antigen binding regions, and there are what are referred to as the conserved staph or stem region. Within the conserved stem region, it's going to point away from the cell, and we'll see this within some of the animations here, that will allow for binding of the T cell or the B cell to it, whereas the antigen binding center is a highly variable region that gets reconfigured with each specific antigen that is interacted with. Within the central part of the molecule, it's referred to as the hinge region. The hinge region is held together by thiol bonds, and it can reconfigure the antigen binding area so that it can fit directly onto each of the antigens. The light chain is the outer area of the Ig or antibody. This light chain is referred to as a light chain because it has less amino acids within it, whereas the heavy chain, the central core, has much more amino acids within the chain, hence being heavier. These are held together 
by hydrogen bondings, as well as adhered together by what's referred to the carbohydrate chain, allowing for the hinge region to start. In terms of structures, we have five distinct classifications that are based off of structure and then what they go about doing. The first is the Ig. The Ig is a simple monomer of immunoglobulin. It's found in uh, fluids, plasma. It's going to defend against bacterial infection, viral infection, toxins, and will activate complement proteins. The next form is the IgD. The IgD is a membrane-bound monomer. These membrane-bound monomers are found on memory B cells and function on B cell activation to known pathogens. The IgE is found in exocrine secretions and get released from mast cells during allergic reactions. One of the principal IgEs is the histamine. However, it's not the only IgE. IgE can also trigger additional histamine release from mast cells due to binding of the mast cell to a known or even unknown um, antigen. IgA is either a monomer or a dimer of immunoglobulins. These are found in secretions, particularly exocrine secretions, such as saliva, tears, and for females, breast milk. This is the first form of passive immunity that we will receive through, through suckling. These IgAs that we, that we receive through suckling is our first form of passive immunity, which we'll talk about when we get to immunocompetence. The last form is what we looked at when we looked at blood typing. These are referred to as the IgMs. The IgMs are complement aggregate proteins, which means that they're going to cause clotting or agglutination of cells within the plasma. These are what's going to react when we have a mismatch of blood types. These are what's going to react when we happen to have some sort of vascular injury that we have to take, take into account or a vascular infection, such as what we see with sepsis. These are a pentamer form of the immunoglobulins. So notice the kind of the uh, uh, snowflake arrangement around the central core. And the reason for this arrangement is so that it allows for multiple cells to clump on to that central immunoglobulin.